Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, another quarterly update from Apollo Capital. My name is uh, Tim Johnston, Managing Director of Apollo Capital. Uh, and today I'm joined by Henry Anderson, Chief Investment Officer, uh, and Mark Woodward, uh, Investment Partner. Uh, so for those of us that are new to Apollo Capital, um, we are Australian-based crypto asset fund manager. Uh, we manage uh, two funds currently. Uh, we've got a few, few funds coming, uh, but we have manage a market neutral fund uh, and a, a long biased fund. Uh, and we have a four year track record now. Um, so we like to think that we are experts in the crypto asset investing space. Uh, and today, uh, apart from investing in, in crypto assets, a lot of what we do is uh, education. Why should we invest in crypto assets? How should we think about investing in crypto assets? Uh, as well as uh, regular updates to uh, our investors uh, like today uh, and others that are following Apollo Capital. Um, so yeah, we are Australian based. I've uh, been going for about four years now uh, and um, we like what we do. So um, today, the purpose of that is uh, to yeah, provide an update to our existing investors, people that have been following Apollo Capital, uh, but also to give uh, the viewers and attendees uh, a chance to ask questions to uh, particularly Henrik and, and Mark, who are driving these portfolios uh, and are, are very much on the forefront of what's happening in, in crypto asset markets. Um, so please feel free to use the chat function. Uh, feel free to use the, the Q&A function, uh, get those questions coming through. We used to do the questions at the end, um, but uh, I think this, let's get, uh, get them through as we come and, and we can um, often put them in uh, where, where relevant. Um, uh, if there are questions about the funds, often we get fun, uh, questions like what are the fees and that sort of stuff. Um, I'll probably just answer them by, by typing a response. Um, but yeah, definitely keen for those questions on what's happening in NFTs or what about this project? What about that project? Uh, where are markets going? What's happening with volatility? Um, all sorts of things. So. Uh, as a start, oh, one more thing. Um, we used to provide updates to our investors via a, a written quarterly letter. Um, and, and that's obviously what we're, we all sort of are familiar with in the traditional space. Um, equity fund managers uh, you know, very commonly provide that quarterly letter. Uh, what, we have, what we've realized uh, at, at Apollo is that crypto markets move so quickly that by the time that you get the prior quarter performance numbers, you write the letter, you distribute it to investors, um, often it's, it's sort of outdated. So uh, I think the quarterly webinar uh, is a more suitable and, and timely format. Uh, so please, we hope you enjoy today. Get those questions coming through and uh, I'll throw to Henrik. Uh, what's been going on crypto markets, Henrik? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tim. So I, I think since we saw the end of the, uh, of, of the year as well, I think maybe I'll give a little bit of a summary quickly, kind of um, what happened during 2021. And then we can really look forward as well, uh, what's ahead of us. Um, so obviously 2021 was a very strong year for, for crypto uh, and also for, for Apollo. So uh, as Tim mentioned, we are running uh, two strategies currently. Uh, our main fund, the Apollo Capital Fund, um, uh, returned 236% in 2021. So that was a great result. Uh, we can compare, compare that to Bitcoin, for example, which uh, saw a 70%. Uh, increase uh, during 2021. Still not bad, uh, but I think that kind of reaffirms our thesis that the world is much bigger than just Bitcoin. And we really encourage investors in the space to have a broader allocation to crypto than just uh, Bitcoin. Um, we are running two funds. The other fund, uh, the Opportunities Fund, is a market neutral fund uh, that many of you are familiar with. Uh, that fund returned 30%. Uh, in the uh, calendar year of 2021. So I think that's also um, a, a good result. Uh, and we had 100% uh, positive months uh, for our market neutral uh, strategy. In terms of uh, returns uh, within the crypto market in 2021, um, I think that was very interesting. In 2020, we saw a big, um, uh, big return in many of the DeFi assets. Uh, uh, 2021 has been uh, labeled DeFi summer um, that compound kicked off. So very return, strong returns in the DeFi sector in, into 2020. 2021 looked much different. Um, so we had, uh, very broadly speaking, uh, two very strong sectors in 2021. Uh, one uh, is what we call alternative layer ones. So alternative smart contract uh, platforms, alternatives to Ethereum. Ethereum's, uh, Ethereum, I, I think it's fair to say, struggled with the amount of transactions uh, because um, a lot of people are using Ethereum. Ethereum very expensive, 
and alternative layer ones did tremendously well in 2021, last year. We will see also many promising um, smart contracts uh, platforms coming to the market during 2021, really. So uh, I think we have a good exposure there in the portfolio. Um, we have things like Polkadot, Algorand, Avalanche, Solana, Matic uh, in that uh, bucket of alternative layer ones. So that's something we are I'm monitoring very closely and um, we will we like to uh, be in the up and coming uh, uh, blockchains that are attracting a lot of the TVL, as we call it, a uh, total value locked in DeFi. And we see uh, that happened to, for example, Avalanche during the last 12 months They have attracted a lot of TVL. A lot of DeFi protocols have launched on Avalanche as just one example. Um, and the user experience that could be pretty good there because uh, transaction costs are very low and transactions are, are fast. So new users coming into the space, into the DeFi space, into the NFT space, um, they might never have used Ethereum and they're getting used to blockchains like Avalanche, like Solana. Uh, so those had a tremendous return during last year. Um, and the other very high level sector that really had a breakthrough year in 2021 uh, is the NFT sector. And I think we'll talk to more about that later, but there was kind of a, really a, a breakthrough, I think mainstream uh, year for, for the whole NFT sector across the different sub verticals within NFT. So you have things like art, you have things like metaverse, uh, in the NFT sector, and that really blew up in, in 2021 and, and really got a mainstream audience. Uh, we saw companies like Facebook changing names to Meta because they see the future in the metaverse. Uh, we saw um, social media platforms like Twitter uh, supporting uh, NFTs natively. Uh, we are seeing platforms like TikTok doing things uh, in the NFT space as well. Um, so I think those two sectors obviously did extremely well in the uh, in the NFT space. Um, so that was kind of a high level uh, what we saw uh, last year. Uh, and then maybe we can go into some more details about the portfolios as well. Eric, I think a, a question that uh, a lot of people will be asking is, is the volatility throughout January and December. Uh, any thoughts on what's driving that? Yeah, so the macro environment is changing quite a bit. We have had a period now for a long time where central banks around the world have cut interest rate to close to zero, in many cases negative. Uh, uh, we have had big QE programs, um, meaning that uh, that's, that's quantitative easing. There's another way for uh, central banks to, uh, um, uh, to kind of flood a market with, uh, uh, with, with money. Uh, and um, that is sort of changing uh, very dramatically. So it's a paradigm shift in the macro environment uh, where there is an expectation now that central banks around the world will start uh, hiking rates. So the macro environment have changed dramatically uh, in, in, in the recent months. And, and uh, what has triggered the central banks to, uh, to, to, to do that is, is the inflation numbers that have, have come come out from, from many countries that, that are at very very high historical levels. Uh, so that has you know increased volatility uh, in global markets, stock markets, and also crypto markets. So uh, it is a changing environment. Um, um, I think in generally when we see uh, you know this type of volatility and not everything going up, that probably is a good time for in the stock market for stock pickers and the same thing in the crypto markets. If you're a fundamental investor, like fundamentals really matters uh, if we are experiencing uh, more volatility, maybe a period of sideways, sideways markets. Uh, that's usually when kind of fundamentals matter. Um, and we obviously think that crypto markets is an excellent area for fundamental investing because uh, it's much less explored than, say, the stock market, where you have, you know, very, very quite efficient markets, uh, perhaps, but crypto markets are very different, uh, driven by different forces. 
So it's not necessarily a bad time to be in active investors like, like, like we are. And Mark, do you had uh, something to add on that? Yeah, I think the, the other thing I was going to uh, add on that is that, you know, the crypto markets historically um, have been influenced very strongly by memes and sort of and sort of the past performance. Um, the expectation, I think, across the market this year is that Q4 would have been a very, very strong one, especially for, you know, the top two, you know, cryptos and especially Bitcoin. Um, there was a lot of talk during the year about the stock to flow model, which sort of predicted a uh, exponential rise in you know, in the price of Bitcoin in Q4, that obviously didn't happen. Uh, I think attention was spread into uh, NFTs, Ethereum, alternative layer ones. Uh, and that's so, um, you know, but still people, I think, position themselves for a very strong Q4, sort of based on previous halving cycles. Uh, and so perhaps had too much leverage. And then going into, you know, into January, there was a lot of thought about regulatory concerns and that sort of fed upon itself and uh, caused a significant and unexpected downdraft in the markets. Yeah, that's, that's always been my thoughts on the stock to flow model. Um, and for those not familiar, um, feel free to Google. Uh, and it's a great model. I hope it's right, but models are made to be broken, right? Um, so uh, I, I hope that it does hold for a long period of time, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it, it didn't. Um, but on that, one thing that we, we've uh, discussed as, as a team is uh, correlation. Uh, and uh, and obviously with uh, markets, traditional markets trending down in, in January, December uh, and crypto markets following suit, it sort of goes against what we used to say, which is crypto doesn't correlate. Uh, and that was you know, back when we sort of launched and, and you know, there were, uh, the, the data suggested that crypto doesn't correlate. More recently along the journey, we've said that crypto tends not to correlate. Uh, Henrik, keen on your thoughts on does crypto correlate? Does it not? <laughs> where, where, where does it sit? Yeah, I think over time we have seen fairly low correlation to other markets. Uh, you know, that might, I think there is an expectation as, as crypto grows and, and market cap of crypto increases, you're getting more of the traditional investors into crypto, uh, that, that in correlation might, might increase uh, in the future. Um, I think from time to time, correlation has been strong. So we saw that in uh, right when, 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 when COVID started in, in March 2020, we saw a high correlation. Uh, I think maybe we have seen that more recently as well. I know, Tim, you've made some studies about the correlations before, and you probably have some, some good thoughts on this as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a thing to update. Uh, I think we'll update the correlation numbers uh, between crypto assets and, and you know, Australian equities, Australian bonds uh, every six months or so. So that's on the, on the to-do list. Um, so watch out for our insights page and our newsletter. Um, we'll, we'll be updating people on that. Um, now, we've got lots of questions coming through, which is great. But before we do, uh, NFTs, Mark, I like to describe you as our resident NFT expert. Uh, what have we been seeing in, in NFTs over the last quarter and, and even 2021? Sure, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, it's hard to be an expert these days. There's just absolutely so much going on in NFTs. Um, you know, I think the major trends that you know that Henrik highlighted. If you look back to 2020, that was really sort of the rise of DeFi, right? So decentralized finance, where you're seeing sort of these traditional financial activities now moving on to a decentralized platforms allowing people to have self, self custody, be able to hold the, the assets themselves, um, to be able to trade on a peer to peer way. And that really created that, that sort of infrastructure, everyone has a wallet and the ability to trade amongst themselves. Um, and so as you fast forward into 2021, you really saw the rise of NFT started off with the um, sort of collectible art, the sort of fine art, um, uh, you know, the kind of digital art like people and Trevor Jones and, and others. Uh, and then it moved into things called PFPs, right? You know, which are profile pictures that allowed people to have a, um, a digital identity, right? Whether they wanted to stay anonymous or pseudonymous, um, you know, but, you know, to be able to have this scarce proof of their identity and their activity um, on, uh, on crypto. And so uh, all that activity in um, NFTs, all the new brands coming in, um, all the new, um, you know, PFP projects, really drove a lot of activity on, on uh, Ethereum and on other alternative layer one blockchains, right? So that drove or sort of brought forward a lot of activity uh, onto those chains. And that's why we saw the outperformance. So from a, a portfolio uh, standpoint, layer ones had an exceptional year and the alternative layer ones um, you know, did even better. Um, uh, DeFi, as Henrik said, did not have a great year as focus and attention moved to uh, NFTs and this huge trend. 
What I think you're going to see going forward is um, uh, more of a discussion rather about NFTs specifically as the asset class, but more about Web3 and, you know, in the metaverse, right? So these are going to be the overarching uh, themes over the next few years as people uh, spend more and more time uh, online or more comfortable having more of their assets um, in sort of a digital basis. Um, they're going to want to be able to prove that they own them and that they are unique. And brands are going to start identifying you by the uh, NFTs that you own. So if you have a you know a particular uh, NFT from a certain brand, whether it's an online game or an online casino or a fashion brand like Gucci or or Nike, which which have all sort of launched NFTs and you know in the past year, you know they're starting to recognize this is a way to clearly identify their customers um, and create more brand affinity and loyalty um, online. So, um, so yeah, and, you know, just to clarify, we, we do get um, lots of questions, you know, do we buy uh, NFTs? Are we investing in specific games? Are we doing anything like that? Um, and, you know, the short answer is, is no. So we are long-term capital allocators, uh, very early investors in DeFi. So 2020 was a great year. I was starting to invest in alternative layer ones um, uh, at the end of that year and into 2020. Uh, one, so um, uh, we try to look at these major trends. So we'll only invest in sort of infrastructure uh, plays, uh, you know, that will benefit from all the activity on NFTs um, or or in games or in the metaverse. So we're actively starting to deploy capital. We've actually started to incubate deals um, uh, internally and and are setting up a, a, a DAO to help um, incubate new deals in Web3 in Australia. Yeah, so that leads to, thanks, Mark. So that leads to a, a, one of the first questions was uh, NFTs, how do you get access to the offerings? So uh, we're not necessarily focusing on offerings of individual NFTs, like art-like NFTs, uh, but maybe some of the infrastructure offerings or NFT uh, infrastructure offerings, how, how do we get access to them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Apollo Capital's track record and, and history in the markets. Um, we have great relationships globally, um, you know, with founders all over the world you know, with other VC funds. And as I mentioned, um, you know, we will often uh, incubate deals internally or, or become very early advisors to, you know, promising projects. Um, so deal flow is generally not, not uh, you know, too much of an issue. Yeah, we have, uh, we have as, uh, as Mark said, a very strong kind of international network. And we have, I think we have a good reputation as well, uh, which will help. And I think during the last year, we've been more active in the primary markets than we've ever been before, right? So we've done one to two deals per month. Uh, it's everything from you know, DeFi focused deals like uh, strips, like Lyra, like Tracer. Uh, it's also secondary market deals. So that's that's a new trend we saw last year. So things like one inch uh, coming to the market, raising the capital, they already have a token that is trading. Uh, that was the biggest deal we've ever done. Uh, that was a $2 million deal for, for Apollo. Uh, Pocket is another one that is secondary uh around uh with a token that is already trading so we can participate in those deals as well and then as mark said we have obviously here in australia a very strong network and recently we've been helping projects and we have taken them globally so i think we have a couple of deals that has been announced like period in the nft space uh like pre po in the in the DeFi space and we just completed an, another deal um, on the Ethereum side that hasn't been announced as well yet, but those are all examples of early stage projects, Australian based, that Apollo has taken to you know, the our global network, the top crypto funds globally. Uh, and uh, and uh, we hope to see more of that uh, this year, certainly. Thanks, Henrik. I think that that example there of, of Perion uh, is a really interesting one. So a, a common question I, I get from investors is, uh, what does an NFT infrastructure project look like? Uh, and so, you know, people are sort of getting their head around NFTs. Uh, you talk about, the, you know, the term infrastructure. Uh, I've had some people say to me, does that mean you're investing in like data centers? Um, so maybe Perion is an example of uh, that sort of infrastructure play or that broader play rather than specific NFTs. Maybe you can talk about that and explain what, what Perion is. Yeah, uh, Perion specifically is, is, is uh, something called a game uh, guild. Uh, that's something relatively new. Uh, uh, Perion is a DAO that holds NFTs um, and they are focused on the gaming side of the NFT world. And they are 
renting those NFTs out for two gamers that are using them in games and they can actually earn an income using those NFTs. So that's sort of kind of a broader concept than just investing in a specific N NFT. Uh, 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 perhaps another example would be Immutable. Uh, so Immutable is creating uh, a layer two marketplace for NFTs. So marketplaces are what we would consider an infrastructure for NFTs. They're using something called CK rollups uh, using the Starkware technology. Um, it's by the way, an Australian uh, based project. So that's a typical example. And there are also other examples in our portfolio of, of, of NFT kind of infrastructure like projects. Yes, Mark. Yeah, so I always like to add just, just on the gaming side, I'm sure everybody who's in crypto has, has played some, some kind of game at some point in their lives, so they'll understand this. Um, you know, in gaming, it's all about achievements and earning rewards and earning, you know, new items in game. Um, uh, historically, these items have been siloed within the game. You can't transfer those items to another game or even that sort of level that you're at. So if you're a, you know, if you're the king of uh, World of Warcraft, that doesn't mean anything in, in any other game. Well, what Web3 and the metaverse and things like Parian are going to allow you to do is to sort of take that reputation and that status over to other games where you'll have access to other items, whether you either want to rent them um, or buy them or sell an equivalent uh, item throughout the game, right? So if you if you have the you know the biggest gun in in um, uh, you know a war game, you want the biggest sword in the sort of Dungeons and and Dragons you know type game. Um, so that's the important thing, and that that's really the fundamental improvement is that you will have these items that you can earn, right? They are valuable because you spend your time. Um, creating them, if you will, or earning them. And then you can sell them to other players or lease them to other players if they want to use them uh, in their game. And that's something that Parion will help players do. So it'll lease out certain items for new players who want to pay a small fee and then give back a share of the, the rewards to Parion. It's all about ownership, right? The NFT market is all about ownership, right? Gamers owning their own items instead of all the profits going to the uh, studios. I, I think the same th thing might happen in the music industry as well, uh, where, where the artists can really own their, their audience, all right, in a, in a completely different way. And that's thanks to the NFT technology, the crypto technology, right? I have a question for you, Mark. So uh, the NFT market is driven by gaming, for example, right? Or, uh, or pieces of art or, or the metaverse, which seems very different kind of forces then say drive financial markets so do you think the correlation as we spoke about before is much lower when it comes to the nft market do you think do you think the financial markets could be in a bear market while the nft market sort of still uh, uh, still sees a lot of growth because they are driven by by other forces yeah i think that's right i mean i think um if i just look at DeFi, i mean i think my expectation is that um you know long term we're you know, still very optimistic about it. We think that increasing capital and as more sophisticated investors come into crypto, i.e. institutions, once the regulatory frameworks are in place, you'll start to see those institutions want to do the same sort of things that they do, you know, in the traditional financial markets, whether that's fixed income, interest rate swaps, derivatives, options trading, um, you know, mortgages, all those things will eventually come onto crypto in large size. Um, you know, the metaverse gaming area and sort of music, that's a different cohort, right? That's a different group of people. And so they're going to be driven by more like entertainment and, you know, and community. Um, but I do think that some of the financial forces, you know, will, will creep in on the NFT market, right? So if you have a big inventory of, of, of beeples and they're just sort of sitting there and they're not really generating any yield, well, you know, can you stake them somewhere and borrow against them, use stable coins to... Um, uh, you know, do another strategy in crypto. So I think you'll start to see more of these NFT infrastructures and, and financialization of, of NFTs, um, you know, over, over the next few years, now that there's just simply so much capital in there. Um, you know, people want yield. If you're in crypto, you don't want to just hold assets. You want to stake your Ethereum. You want to get yield from your Bitcoin. You know, if you're doing uh, early stage tokens, you know, you want to stake those tokens to generate additional yield. And so I think that will creep into uh, NFTs and gaming as well. So if somebody has the biggest sword, they don't just keep it, you know, locked away in a game. They're going to rent it out to somebody else or, you know, deposit it in a guild. And I think it's very interesting that um, you see a lot of assets, at least sort of in the traditional 
uh, or you know, you know, sort of collectible and, and PFP world sitting on exchanges, you know, like OpenSea or Nifty Gateway, earning zero yield. So as soon as there are platforms that that can offer you yield and the security of holding um, large amounts of your capital, I think you you'll start to see a you know a potential vampire attack, and we've seen that a little bit you know with OpenSea as well already. Uh, so when you start to provide yield, um, you know, looks rare is a good example. You know, those assets move very very quickly. You know, in the traditional art world, if you staked a, a Van Gogh and you borrowed you know five million dollars against it. You know that's a very hard transaction to sort of uh, unwind, or if it's locked in a in a vault somewhere in Zurich, you know those are very um, hard assets to get yield from. But in crypto world, everything's on chain, um, and there's you know numerous ways to generate yield from these things. Yeah, that's super interesting. Like it opens up the whole collectible market uh, in in a whole different way, right? And there will yeah. be intersection between DeFi and and NFT world, and that's already happening. That's right. Excellent. Let's uh, jump into some questions, guys. So uh, first question from Josh. Uh, what did you make of IMX slash GameStop partnership? Uh, the token dump by GameStop last week. And where do you see IMX positioned within the NFT competitive landscape? Yeah, good question. So what happens there is that uh, IMX uh, partnered up with GameStop. Uh, IMX uh, uh, transferred uh, tokens to GameStop uh, uh, for this partnership. Um, I'm sure immutable, uh, you know, saw this as a long-term relationship. Uh, and uh, what happened was that, uh, uh, that that GameStop sold, market sold uh, tokens. Uh, and that was, you know, obviously not good for the IMX price. So I think in the future, when we see these kind of deals, there will be vesting schedules and things like that. You, it's not expectations, I guess, when you go into a partnership with someone that they would would dump those tokens uh, on the market. Uh, so that's definitely unfortunate. Um, you know, you can question sort of whose fault it is, GameStop or or Immutable. Should they have paid in 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 US dollars instead? Um, if if you give a token that is unvested, it's basically like a US dollar equivalent anyway, right? So. Uh, that was not a very good structured deal. Um, um, and I think people would be very careful uh, with that going forward. So IMX, uh, Immutable is interesting because they are building on one of these Ethereum uh, layer twos. Um, and um, the thesis is that you know Ethereum is still sort of the strongest network in crypto. So you would uh, want to build on Ethereum. Um, there are perhaps some drawbacks uh, uh, with other type of layer twos like optimistic uh, rollups because uh, you cannot transfer tokens uh, immediately between layer one and, and and the base chain. But with the technology that Immutable is working on, that 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 is much more uh, seamless. Um, so, uh, you know, I think they have something really promising uh, going on. Um, still very early days, uh, but they're one of the uh, you know global recognized players in the NFT space uh, on on the infrastructure side. So we are excited to be supporters. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this is an interesting question from Vikash. Uh, is the high gas fees being addressed at Ethereum, or do you think that the alternate options will take away the transactions? And and how does how do we structure the portfolio to uh, cater for both you know both uh, cases? Yeah, I think there is a case to be made that Ethereum main chain is not really meant for people. So people are not going to transact on the Ethereum main chain. Uh, layer two rollups will transact on the, uh, on the main chain. Um, so uh, when you are running things like um, what Immutable is building, or there is other rollups called Arbitrum and Optimism, uh, they are verifying transaction back to the main chain. So the main chain is expected to be full of these kind of verification transactions. Um, and the users, the end users, they will um, interact with the, uh, with the rollups. And that's kind of the way to design blockchains. Um, um, at least that's what a lot of people um, uh, are thinking these days because like a monolithic layer one will never be able to scale enough. All right, so you will uh, kind of need that kind of layer two, two technology anyway, 
and that's the path that Ethereum is going down. So, uh, you know, gas fees might stay high on the Ethereum main chain and that might be completely fine. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and what we've talked about before is, as well is that we, uh, we do have the allocations to uh, other uh, alternative layer ones so that uh, if, if uh, Ethereum does uh, not perform as strongly then, uh, and the transactions are taken away from the other layer ones that uh, hopefully the portfolio will still will still benefit from that scenario. Yeah, and, 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 and uh, it's not just as a hedge, right? We believe in this multi-chain future. Yeah. And I think that thesis has nev never been uh, more strong than now. So one of the big uh, kind of themes for 2022 is this multi-chain future and investing in the infrastructure uh, underpinning that. So uh, we recently released um, a research report on chain flip, for example, which is providing exactly that kind of infrastructure for this new multi-chain world. Uh, that's a cross-chain uh, swap technology that, that we were seed investors into that we are super excited about uh, that is coming to the market this year. Um, and we have other kind of multi-chain uh, uh, place in the portfolio as well. Um, Ren is one example that we have held for a long time. We're also investing in, in bridges, for example. Uh, great, thank you. Quick one from uh, Tim Wong. Uh, how much cash do we hold in the Poly Capital Fund? Uh, and how do we take advantage of buying opportunities? Are we selling existing assets? Uh, we've got some inflows coming in generally each month. How does that work? Yeah, so we are, uh, we are normally you know, fully deployed, but we have market neutral strategies as well. So uh, we have a, a sleeve of the portfolio uh, in market neutral uh, uh, strategies. So if we wanted to, there's a new opportunity coming uh, want to deploy capital, we can always sort of uh, draw down that market neutral sleeve. Maybe, maybe, maybe good to step back uh, a little bit and talk about how we structure the portfolio. So uh, if you look here during the last 12 months, uh, we, have, we have an allocation to layer one blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, the alternative layer ones that we talked a lot about today. That allocation has been around 50% of the portfolio, sometimes more sometimes less. And then we have a market neutral sleeve that, that has ranged during the last 12 months from 10% to 20%. It's currently sitting around 16% or so. Um, and then we have uh, the rest of the portfolio which are investing in the DeFi assets we had talked about uh, in the new NFT infrastructure projects that are coming to the market. From a this question from Douglas, uh, from a stablecoin and DeFi perspective, any issue with UST uh, and the Anchor Protocol yield reserve? Uh, yeah, so two very good questions there. Uh, Tether, I think we have spoke about uh, in the last few years, we kind of frequently get a question about uh, Tether. I think there has been no new development recently around Tether. They have settled with a number of US regulators during the last 12 months, which is a positive sign. I do expect we will see more stablecoin regulation coming out of the US this year. That's one of my predictions. Um, when it comes to Anchor Protocol, uh, they are currently uh, uh, giving a yield of just below 20% for, for stablecoins. That is sort of not an organic yield that's uh, uh, that's a yield that's uh, a yield reserve that is being drawn down and and uh, uh, might soon be topped up um, but it doesn't seem like it's uh, long term sustainable at, at this level uh, we don't have any exposure to anchor at the moment i, th I think douglas was also asking about ust so terra Oh, you, you sorry, sorry, sorry. maybe I misunderstood the, the question. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, so last year we've seen um, an explosion in decentralized stable coins. Um, uh, and we think that's super interesting. interesting. We are supporters of some decentralized stable coins. We think there is a big future for decentralized stable coins. Uh, Tyra has done a fantastic job um, in, um, in coming to the market during the last 12 months. We have seen tremendous growth in, in, in Terra. Uh, we have seen a lot of volatility in, in Luna, which is a token backing Terra. And despite all that volatility, um, the UST has held its peg. So uh, we are bullish generally on decentralized stablecoins and on Terra. 
What are your thoughts on Vitalik's recent views of infeasibility of a multi-chain future due to liquidity and security constraints of bridges? Uh, to be honest, I have not uh, seen that uh, uh, that post or or comment from Vitalik, so it's hard to comment on. Uh, Mark, do you, do you uh, have you seen that? Yeah, I haven't seen it either, but I think that, I mean, as a general, uh, you know, comment, uh, as Henrik said earlier, I think we believe in a multi-chain future, right? So it's going to require innovation um, in these bridges and, and new innovation to allow um, uh, swaps across chains. Bridges um, are hard to build and, and they're hard to build in a decentralized way. So uh, um, there's a lot of work uh, that needs to go into that. We have seen a number of security exploits in bridges and, and just one uh, last week, right? With a, with a Solana bridge called Wormhole. It was the second largest DeFi hack ever, $325 million. Um, um, luckily they got a very, very strong uh, backer in, in Jump who is, uh, who is um, making them whole. Um, so, um, so, but it's, uh, you know, interesting area and we'll continue to invest in, in, in bridges and on other multi-chain infrastructure because, uh, we are, we are believers of a multi-chain future. Brett asks, love to get your views on a spot BTC ETF. Uh, and when you think it may get approval and maybe just for a bit of background there, Henrik, I can talk about the existing ETFs, uh, particularly in the States. Yeah. So, uh, last year was, uh, kind of a watershed moments when it came to ETFs in the US because that's something that the industry has been working on for 10 years. And finally, we got the first uh, Bitcoin ETFs uh, listed uh, in the US, but they are based on, on futures and not spot. And that's probably not the best product for, for the end consumers because you have a lot of costs related to futures. You need to roll them and uh, they can try to tra trade at the premium at times and there's a cost involved with that. So not, not the best product that was improved. I do hope there is a spot product coming to the market. It's very hard to say when. Um, in general, the US regulators, uh, um, I think even though they approved the Bitcoin ETF uh, has been a little bit uh, on the disappointing side uh, recently. Um, and I also don't think the um, Biden administration is uh, perhaps uh, at that 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 promising for, for for crypto regulation in the US in the short term. Um, but um, there, might, there might be a Bitcoin uh, spot ETF in, in other regions. There might be one in Australia uh, coming to the market this year. Mark asks, uh, and I'll throw this one to you, Mark. Um, we talked about this a little bit, but how are you positioned thematically for the expected growth in Web3, gaming and fan rewards tokens? Uh, and a particularly interesting question in this is any view on the next themes coming after that, Mark? <laughs> really sort of crystal ball stuff. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, as we've highlighted during this call, I think we've um, established a broad thematic internally investment thesis that we that we want to position ourselves for the growth in those areas. Um, we haven't done a lot in fan rewards. I also noticed there's a question in Q, Q and A about sort of music platforms. And while I, uh, you know, sort of am interested that in that on a personal level, it's not something we've sort of discussed internally. Um, so I think um, broad interest for us looking at new projects um, in those spaces, you know, positioning the, the fund to take advantage for all the activity that, you know, that's going to be happening on, on those platforms. So I think we're well across it, um, as mentioned, well connected, and uh, it's a space that we're definitely researching. I think an interesting tweet I saw last year from Vitalik uh, was a question uh, posed, which was what, what is the use case for Ethereum that you didn't see coming? Uh, and Ethereum replied to that question saying NFTs. And I thought <laughs> that's, that's pretty amazing because I think our sort of investment thesis from day one has been there's just going to be so much innovation in this space. We don't know what's coming. <laughs> We're going to try and stay on top of it, um, but you, you don't know. And I think that that's kind of uh, been backed up by the fact that Ethereum you know, co-founder co uh, didn't see NFTs coming and that's obviously been a main use uh, yeah. or, or a large use case for Ethereum. The other, the other thing I just want to say, just to, you know, just to dovetail on that last question on, on ETFs and sort of the political in, environment, um, clearly the Biden administration uh, intends to regulate or you know, direct the agencies to start to regulate. 
Um, and you, you've sort of seen a, a very interesting um, uh, sort of counter you know, to this, where you're seeing some of the Republican senators and red states adopt Bitcoin. You're seeing Arizona and Texas starting to talk about it as a legal tender. You're seeing Ted Cruz, you know, who's, who's you know, gone out and bought $50,000 of Bitcoin. Uh, you've seen a DAO be created, you know, by crypto enthusiasts and 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 certain exchanges to, um, you know, really donate and support to the crypto friendly senators and representatives in the U.S. So I think, you know, in the coming, you know, in the coming midterms and and you know perhaps even in the presidential election, you're going to see you know crypto be a political um, speaking point for sure. And I think you're going to see a lot of voters, especially you know the younger generations, be um, uh, single, single topic voters, right? So if someone's against crypto, they're not going to vote for them. They're for them. They're going to vote for them. And that's going to be sort of the single issue. Um, I, I think one of the most interesting things sort of in the political domain going forward is which of the senators and reps and even sort of presidential candidates are going to, are going to come out, uh, on crypto. Yeah. And, uh, there are 50 million Americans, right. Holding crypto. So that's, that, that's potentially a very strong force, right? Yes. Yeah. Young people. Question from Hayden, uh, what do you believe ASICs and the regulators in Australia's view are on NFTs and cryptos? Uh, do you think, uh, so, so I guess from an Australian perspective, uh, and do you think we will see adoption from larger corporations and the ASX eventually? Yeah, I mean, I think on NFTs, that's not even really on the radar for them. You know, they'll see that as sort of a, a you know, a game or a hobby. So I don't expect any sort of regulation there. Um, that's sort of buyer beware. If you want to play in that sandbox, they're going to let you do it. Um, uh, you know, on, on ETFs and other regulation, I think we will see that. My general sense is that it'll be favorable. Um, so I think, you know, the government here will recognize that it's a, an important asset class um, and will, we'll, you know, probably institute the usual safeguards for retail investors. Worth mentioning as well that we are in active um, conversations with regulators in Australia. And, and Henrik, I think, can you provide a bit of background on your experience um, with uh, Commonwealth Bank? Uh, not just your experience, because you've obviously spoken to them, but um, you know, they, they had some pretty promising developments for an you know, a, a Australian institution, which tend to be more on the conservative side. Um, but, but what they came out with last year, I think, was promising. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's the CBA. Uh, the, the one, obviously, the largest bank here in, in the area last year announced that they are uh, going to support crypto um, as as an asset that their customers uh, can trade. Uh, so that was, I think was a very big development. I think that might be kind of in in a beta phase now. I'm not sure it's it's been rolled out uh, fully to the public yet, but it's underway. I think they also announced that they. Uh, took an equity stake in Gemini, which is their their partner behind uh, uh, that effort. Um, so that's really exciting. Hopefully, as the first first step, but uh, to see a, an Australian bank uh, supporting crypto, I think it's fantastic. And I think it's a pretty dramatic change as well. I mean, we've seen uh, not necessarily with our business, but other businesses in crypto in Australia. Uh, if the banks get wind that your business has anything to do with crypto, they will aggressively shut down the bank accounts. Um, and so for, uh, and Commonwealth Bank has, has been part of that. Um, so you know, for, for them to change from that aggressive anti-stance to, to pro uh, crypto and, and exploring the area further, I think is, is very interesting. Oh yeah, I think we're up uh, 11.45 uh, in, in Australia, uh, 45 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for everyone attending. Thank you to Mark and Henrik for your uh, wonderful insights. Um, uh, again, if, uh, if you missed this or if uh, anyone would like to see it, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any questions about the funds, uh, investors at apollocap.io, um, feel free to email uh, that email address or go through the website. Um, but again, thank you very much for joining us uh, and have a wonderful rest of your day.